My name is Sobhnath Ghosh, um, I'm the president of Agile Denver. Um, this is the fourth year we are having the Mile High Agile uh, conference. Um, we've had great success, we've had uh, great input from people, and we want to make this uh, a, a people conference where it makes sense for pe folks within the local area to come here, learn, network, and just be awesome Agilists and elevate the level of agility in the, uh, the region. Come to Agile Denver. Uh, be uh, be part of us for uh, the whole year where we have monthly meetings and uh, be part of us when we have our annual conference. So I welcome everybody to visit with Agile Denver and be part of a conference and the Agile Denver family. Thank you. I was a software engineer long before I came, became involved in Agile. I first became acquainted with Robert C. Martin through his book, Clean Code. In this book, Uncle Bob, as he's known, introduced me to the idea that a process, crafting my code in a certain way, could speed delivery, reduce defects, and improve its quality. I started following Robert through the blog of his consulting firm, Object Mentor, which has partnered with Fortune 500 companies for the past 15 years. Time and time again, I found Uncle Bob's writing to be very approachable and that it contained solid advice. Fast forward a number of years. I became involved with the user group Agile Denver, first as a conference volunteer, just like today, then as an organizer, and I joined the board of directors last year. When it came to select this year's keynote speaker, Alex, or sorry, Agile Denver's founder and fellow board member, Alex Vicio, brought up Robert's name. Robert C. Martin signed the Agile Manifesto, and he was the founder and the first chairman of the Agile Alliance. He's been an authority in Agile software delivery since the beginning, making him a perfect candidate to kick off today's conference. It's my honor and a privilege to welcome Robert to the stage to share the future of Agile, if any. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> So this is Mile High Agile, huh? <sighs> Imagine that um, my outstretched arms represent the age of the Earth. Uh, the Earth formed here. And uh, 
vets today. Where on this timeline did the dinosaurs live? Sorry. Right there. Uh, the dinosaurs came into existence at the second knuckle. They went out of existence on the third knuckle. Uh, the tip of my finger is about 65 million years. The dinosaurs managed to live for about 100 million years, starting oh, right about there. When did life crawl out of the ocean? Right there. But prior to this, the land was barren. There were no plants. There were no animals on land. There were some fish. Where did, the, where did life um, begin? There. The first fossils that we can find are well over 3 billion years old. Um, apparently, life was, was around for a very long time, but it didn't do much from that wrist to this wrist. At least by our lights, it didn't do much. What was it doing? Three billion years, what was that life doing before it turned into animals and plants that we would recognize? What it was doing was making oxygen. The little, uh, little one-celled creatures that evolved right here just shortly after the Earth formed um, began to use sunlight to um, produce oxygen. Now, oxygen's bad stuff. You don't want to live in it. Well, we do. But you'd rather not because eh, it catches fire. It's very corrosive. It's a nasty gas to actually have to live within. Um, we depend upon it that we evolved to. But back in those days, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. And um, that meant that all of the iron in the world could be safely dissolved in the oceans. Uh, iron likes to go into solution. So uh, the oceans were rich with iron. They had this, the, the ocean had this nasty greenish kind of color um, because dug, iron in, dissolved in water has that color. As these uh, little one-celled creatures began to produce oxygen, that oxygen would bind to the iron, turn it into rust. The rust would fall to the ocean floor and turn into iron ore. It took three billion years to get all the iron out of the ocean. And right about here is when oxygen started to accumulate in the atmosphere. Think about that. But that's not what we're supposed to talk about. Our talk today, or my talk today, is called The Future of Agile, If Any. It might be a depressing talk. It might not. I think it depends on your uh, point of view. Agile uh, began, does anybody know? Where it began? How long have people been doing agile development? Even before it was called agile development, how, many, how long was, have people been doing what we would recognize today as agile? Uh, the, um, the software for the Mercury space capsule was developed in uh, one-day iterations. Uh, they, made, they wrote their unit tests in the morning. They made them pass in the afternoon. That would have been the early 60s. Um, much of the software for big military in the 60s was done with a process that we would recognize today as having uh, attributes of agile. It was done in short iterations. There was lots of testing, lots of communication and feedback. It was a, an interesting time to be a software developer in the late 60s. Uh, and then something happened. We're not exactly sure what it was. The waterfall revolution kind of took over. And, and for well, almost 30 years, we, um, we fought with this idea that software ought to be planned. And then in um, the early 2000s, 2001, I think it was, maybe it was 2002, I can't remember, a bunch of us got together at Snowbird and we started to... Uh, uh, think about what Agile was. And there were, I don't remember how many of us there were. This is a group of guys that 
got together once, never got together again. We don't talk to each other much. Uh, we don't uh, email back and forth. There's not a lot of communication between the signatures of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, those of us who wrote it and signed it and prop promulgated it across the world, uh, have very little to do with each other. Uh, we all got together again about three years ago at the Agile conference, and we all looked at each other and said, I remember why I don't like you. <laughs> at that initial snowbird meeting, Kent Beck said something that set the tone of the meeting and that has stuck with me ever since. He said... You may, may know who Kent Beck is, by the way. Kent Beck was the, the guy who invented or at least um, promoted a process called extreme programming. Uh, in fact, I think this conference used to be called um, Denver XP or something, or XP something at mile. I don't know what it was. But the, what was it, Alex? XP Denver, yeah. So this conference began as XP Denver, and then, of course, we had to change the name to Agile because, well, you, you had to do that. Um, so in this meeting, Kent Beck says, um, the reason that I invented extreme programming and the reason that I believe we are here writing this manifesto is to heal the divide between development and business. Now, that's a fascinating statement. Heal the divide between development and business. What was the nature of that divide? And the nature of that divide, simple, was distrust. Um, developers didn't trust managers. Managers didn't trust developers. Uh, why? Well, because developers would say they'd get something done in a certain time frame, and then they wouldn't. And managers would say, this is what we need, and then later on they'd change the requirements. Who could trust anybody? Right? Because everybody was lying. Every, and then you get into this nice little trap where, oh, well, I can't tell them the truth because then they're going to start messing around with me. So I actually have to grow my estimates so that I don't get burned by having told them something wrong. And the, the management has to do the same thing. They have, to, they have to fudge on their dates, too. They have to accelerate the dates to make the, they make the developers come in earlier. And it's just a nightmare. It's all driven by distrust. So Kent says, the reason we're doing Agile is to heal the divide, this distrust divide between management and business. And how? How would we do this? Transparency. How do you, uh, how do you get trust? You put all your cards on the table. As long as you're not holding any cards against your vest, there's no reason not to trust you. So the whole idea was to get all the cards down. Show what we were doing. Show business what we were doing. Have business show us what they were doing. Get everything laid out on the table. How? This chart I pulled from a talk that I used to give right around 2002, 2003. It's a standard-looking velocity chart. Who's got one of these on the wall? Ooh, not a lot of you. Uh, actually, I'd venture to say none of you. Let's try this again. Who has a chart showing the velocity of their team mounted in a... Oh, I got one! Mounted in a prominent place where everybody can see it. My, another one. Oh, it's fascinating, too. Oh, three! <laughs> We're gaining some momentum here. <laughs> so uh, what is this chart? This is the velocity chart. The idea was real simple. Um, anybody could look at that chart and say, well, geez, um, that first week those guys got uh, 45 points done. What are these points? I don't know, but what if you could believe them? Uh, what if you could believe that they got 45 points done? The next week, uh, 44 and the week after that, it was 50. Anybody could look at that chart and go, huh, looks like these guys are getting uh, 45 points done roughly every week. Um, I think next week they'll probably get 45 points done. Over the next 10 weeks, I imagine they'll get something like 450 points done. Now, that's an amazing thing to be able to say. Some manager can look at that chart and predict the future 
with some kind of reliability. Uh, by the way, predicting the future is a necessary attribute for a manager. You have to be able to predict the future because you've got to you know, make plans and make commitments and buy things and spend money. So the idea that you can predict the future is extremely useful to a manager. Now, this is a graph not of what the developers said they would do. This is a graph of what the developers did do. There's trust involved with this. If they actually did that, and if that graph was put on the wall, and if everybody could see it, then anybody can look at that graph and go, oh, OK, I see what this team is doing. Um, there's another graph that we used uh, frequently. Looks almost the same, but if you notice, uh, it's slightly different. This is a burn down chart. A burn down chart from sprint to sprint to sprint. I had to use the word sprint because I think there's a lot of scrum people here. How many of you are scrum people? Yeah, there's a lot of scrum people here. We didn't used to call them sprints. We used to call them iterations, but sprint is fine, you know, if you want to use the term. So from sprint to sprint to sprint, how many points are left before the next release or the next major deliverable? And uh, you can see there they've got an estimate that says, well, about 520 that first week. And the week after that, it was 480. And the week after that, it was 450. And, uh, Notice there's a funny one at the, about the middle there where they worked for a week and wound up with more to do. Does that happen? Of course it happens. Right? And why would it happen? There's two reasons why this would happen. Uh, one reason is that um, the business came up with more requirements. Does the business ever do this? Does the business ever define a bunch of requirements up front and then add more later? Oh, by the way, we forgot. You need to do this. Of course they do. That's what software is really all about. But the other way that this could happen is for the developers to take a hard look at their original estimates and say, <laughs> those original estimates were complete nonsense. <laughs> we need to re-estimate everything based on the last four sprints we can now see that our estimates were bad and we're going to have to adjust our estimates and they adjust them by moving that bar. Of course, we want that on the chart as well. This is trust. Everybody can see the mistakes. Everybody can see the faults. Everyone can see the progress or lack thereof. Trust. And how do you get that trust? By being transparent. How do you be transparent? Well, here's where Kent, in particular, came up with a set of practices. What you see on the screen here is the last slide I'm going to put on the screen. This will be with us for the rest of my talk. It is the, called the Circle of Life. It was invented by Ron Jeffries probably in 2002 or 2003. It shows the practices of extreme programming. Kent's original idea. Um, I called it the agile software development practices because for the most part, these are the practices that managed to kind of leak into the agile world after that snowbird meeting and more or less define what an agile project uh, would look like, or at least what the disciplines within that project would look like. And it's arranged into three circles. The outer green circle is essentially scrum. The inner red circle are all the developer practices, which we'll talk about in the middle uh, a little bit later. And then the blue circle are all the team-related practices. And if you look carefully at them, you will notice that all of them support this idea of transparency. The planning game over at the far right. Uh, this is the idea that you would make visible estimates that the business would choose stories based on those estimates and based on their value and would um, create sprints based on those estimates. All very transparent, all very open, uh, easy to generate trust. Look at the developer practices. Uh, pairing, pair programming. Okay, let me see. Um, how many people in this room write code for a living? What is that, about 
one-fifth. Okay, now an interesting experiment. How many people in this room do not write code for a living? And this does seem to add up to 100%. So probably about 20% of the people in this room are programmers. I find that strange. I find that strange because extreme programming and agile were built by programmers. The guys at the uh, Snowbird meetings were primarily programmers. Um, Kent was a programmer. You look at these practices and you can see they have a, um, an attitude that is about programming. Where are the programmers? 20% of you are programmers. Why isn't this conference the software conference. Now you've got the tone of my talk, so we'll continue. How do you get... Ha, 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 you dog. How do you get this graph to tell you the truth? Because right now, all that graph shows is points. Do you think developers could lie about points? Anybody had a developer lie to them about points? Yeah, we got 25 points done. Well, what do you mean by done? <laughs> Anybody have uh, a good definition of done out there? Right? Uh, or, or how about this? Has anybody worked at a company where there were several definitions of the word done? You have done and complete, or uh, done and done done. Obviously, this graph means nothing if we don't know what done means. I worked for a company once. Uh, I was a consultant for that company where they, uh, they ran uh, six weeks iterations. You, they're in trouble right away because six weeks is impossibly long. Um, and the definition of done at the end of six weeks was checked in. <laughs> now, you can imagine the kind of stuff that got checked in, right? Like, it didn't have to compile. It certainly didn't have to run. In fact, there were files that were checked in that were utterly empty. Nothing but an empty file with a file name, right? And that meant they were done, met the schedule. The fact that there was a, a problem with the execution of the program fell on somebody else's schedule. It became a bug, and that went on a different schedule. So they were able to stay on time for a very long time. Uh, graphs like this can lie unless you have a practice. And the practice that we have in Agile is acceptance tests. That's over to the far left over there. Notice that's part of the green circle, part of what I would have called scrum. Uh, acceptance tests are tests. Who writes them? Not the programmers. We're trying to get transparency here. If the programmers write the acceptance test, they're going to lie. <laughs> so you don't want the programmers writing the acceptance test. They are called acceptance tests. For a reason, someone other than the programmers has to accept. We'd like the business writing these tests. We'd like uh, business analysts and QA folks to write these tests. Um, let's see, um, anybody here um, doing continuous integration? Yeah, good, okay, we've got a nice CI server all built up. That looks like about a third of you. Although, it was interesting to watch the hands go, eh. <laughs> sort of. If you've got a CI server built up, the point of that CI server is to um, look at the code base. You're watching the source code control system. Whenever anybody checks in a module, you recompile, you rebuild the whole system, and then you run every test. Those tests ought to be acceptance tests and unit tests and all of the tests in the system. And if they pass, you say you're done. 
Those tests become the definition of done. If you follow that practice, then these charts take on a very interesting meaning. Those programmers got 45 points done and passed all their acceptance tests. What's supposed to be done at the end of a sprint? At the end of a sprint, what state is the software supposed to be in? Working. More than working. Deployable. Should it be deployed? Oh, no, that's a business decision. Right? We don't have to deploy it. The business can decide whether or not they want to deploy. The technical team. The developers stand there ready, saying, yes, deploy it. It's ready. It has been QA'd. It has been documented. Everything is done at the end of the sprint. How many of you are done at the end of the sprint? Well, yeah, you're five. What happens when the continuous build fails? Yes, you get an email. Email goes to the team. He, he called it a nasty gram. You get an email, it goes to the whole team. Bob broke the build. <laughs> and then what happens to Bob because of that? He's flogged through the fleet. <laughs> uh, uh, some teams will, um, will have him wear a shirt that said, I broke the build. And nobody washes that shirt. <laughs> when the build breaks... It should be a catastrophic event. Red lights should go off, sirens should be howling, the team should come to a screeching halt and address the issue of why the hell the build broke. Because the build should never break. That's why we're doing continuous integration, to make sure that the build never breaks. Now, what teams do is that they get... Um, they get a little bit um, fuzzy about that. They say, well, we'll fix it later, but, but right now we got to get to the end of this sprint. Tell me what difference it makes to get to the end of a sprint if nothing's working. We've got to get to the end of the sprint, so we're just going to have to keep on developing, and we'll deal with that failure later. And, and by the way, it's annoying to keep getting those nasty grams, so we'll take that test out of the build. Don't do this. Keep the test in the build. Address the test. Keep the tests passing. How do you keep the test passing? You don't check it in until you've run the tests. Programmers, you don't check the code in until you've run the tests. You know? You make sure that it does run. And then if the build fails, it must be something weird. You ever get weird stuff? That's why we have a continuous build, for the weird stuff. What happened to the practice? The practice got softened. Why did the practice get softened? Because the programmers, and possibly the project managers, did not want anyone seeing that there were failures. And so they began to cut into the transparency. When you start fiddling with the practices, when you start softening the practices, your motive for doing this is to hide something. Because the practices expose. Programmers, there are 20% of you in here are programmers. How many of you are pairing at least 50% of the time? Now that's an interesting number. I would say that's about 1 20th of the 20%, which would be about 1%. No, did I get that? Yeah, well, well, I can divide. Yeah, about 1% of the programmers in the, 1% of the people in the room are pairing. Uh, maybe 5% of the programmers are pairing. And now why wouldn't you pair? Hmm. What is it that you're hiding? Now, you might think, well, pairing is, you know, it's kind of a personal decision. No, it's not. A personal decision? No, it's not. It's a team decision. The team decides to pair. And when a team decides not to pair, it's because they want to hide something. I worked at a company once where um, uh, it was a hardware-based company. I, 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 
It was, they made copiers. I won't say any more. They made copiers. And your political clout at this company as a programmer depended on the hardware you wrote code for. If you wrote code for the feeder, you were a peon. Yeah, it didn't matter, because you're in the feeder. If you're writing code for the stapler, scum of the earth. But if you wrote code for the copier, you had power, you had authority, you were the programmer that everyone looked to. In that company, they did not pair. They did not review. In fact, you were not allowed to look at each other's code because that code was the source of political power. And so the guy who was the, wrote the code for the copier, he kept his code separate. No one was allowed to touch it. No one was allowed to look at it. It was a remarkably dysfunctional company. Anybody not pairing is emulating those guys. There's something being hidden. It might be some aspect of your personality. I don't know what you're hiding, but something is being hidden. How many of you do code reviews? Ooh, look at that. Wait a minute, that's more than there are programmers. <laughs> code reviews, oh, well, that's the solution, isn't it? Let's just do code reviews. Okay, all right, wait, wait, wait. How many of you have been to a code review where um, you go into the meeting, some guy puts code on the screen, he walks you through it, an hour later you leave the meeting and you all walk out going, geez, I hope that guy knew what he was talking about. That's not a code review. Here's the rule for code reviews. The reviewer looks at every line in detail. The amount of time spent reviewing a module is roughly proportional to the amount of time it takes to write the module. If it takes five hours to write a module, it should take some fairly large fraction of five hours to review the module because you need to go through the same thought process that the author went through. Now, how many of you are doing code reviews? Yeah, okay, so that's much more like it. Probably not too many, but then now ask yourself why. And you can always use this lovely excuse about going fast. Well, we have to go fast. Well, you go fast by going well. You go fast by doing things in a disciplined, orderly, professional way. You don't go fast by rushing. Your mother taught you this long ago, you know, don't clean your room by throwing everything under the bed. It's not really cleaning the room, right? You actually have to put things away into drawers and fold them up neatly and hang them up. That's how you clean your room. Otherwise, you've just still got a mess on your hands. You cannot go fast by rushing. That's one of the lessons we learned in those practices. You cannot go fast by rushing. How do you go fast? See that inner red circle there? That inner red circle is how programmers go fast. That inner red circle says you're going to pair program some fraction of the time, maybe 50% of the time. You're going to do test-driven development. Programmers, how many of you are doing test-driven development? OK, that's maybe a third of the people who said they were programmers. I will define test-driven development for you and see if you keep your hand up. Refactoring. You clean the code after you write it, and you practice simple design. You keep the design as simple as you possibly can at all times. And that's how you go fast. There are two values of software. There's the value of what the software does. This is what we believe programmers are paid to. Pro programmers are paid to make machines behave in a certain way. It's all about the behavior of the machine. But there's a second value to software. The word software is a compound word. What's the first of the words in that compound word? Soft. Thank you. Software is supposed to be soft. What does soft mean? 
easy to change. If something is soft, you can mold it. Software is supposed to be easy to change. If we didn't want it to be easy to change, we would have called it hardware. <laughs> but we had hardware, and we knew it was hard to change, and we wanted something that was easier to change. We wanted a way to adjust the behavior of a machine easily. So we invented software. That's what software is for. It was supposed to be easy to change. The second value of software is that it's easy to change. If you give me a module that works perfectly, how long will that module be relevant? Well, the requirements are going to change on you. It'll become irrelevant pretty quickly. In order to keep it relevant, I need to be able to change it. If I can't change that module, because it's hard to change, then that module's worthless. It might have done exactly the right thing for a week. After that week, it's useless, because I can't change it, and it doesn't do what I need anymore. On the other hand, if you give me a module that does not work, but I can change it, I can make it work. Which of these two values is the more important? And obviously, it's the one that allows the software to continue working long term. It is not so important that you get the software to work as it is that you keep the software soft. And that's what those practices do. Those inner practices in there keep the software soft. Those are the two criteria of done. Acceptance tests test that the software does what it's supposed to, the least of the two values. Those inner practices make sure that the software stays flexible. How? How do you make sure that software is flexible? You flex it. You change it. You refactor it. If you can go around that loop, if you can refactor all the time, your software is flexible because you're re-changing it. How do you know if software is changeable? You change it all the time. You license yourself to make changes. How many people are now terrified? The man is insane. You want us to change working code? They'll break it. No, they won't. They're doing test-driven development. They're not going to break it. You want to keep your software soft, you refactor it, you change it. But you can't change it unless you've got tests. And the only good way to get tests is to get test-driven development. To practice test-driven development so that you know you have not broken it. See, these practices tie together. They tie together into a system that is transparent, that backs up the notion of done. So what happened after the meeting at Snowbird? At Snowbird, we, um, we argued for a while about the name of whatever we'd call this thing. And uh, some of us said it should be called Lightweight Processes. That was the name of the meeting, by the way. The, the name of the meeting was the Lightweight Process Summit. And when we got there, everybody said, lightweight has kind of a negative connotation. You know, what we're doing is kind of lightweight. So we need a better name. And uh, a few people tossed out the name Adaptive. Jim Highsmith, I think, liked that name. Adaptive. You know, let's call it Adaptive. And the rest of us kind of went, nah, we don't like Adaptive. Uh, and then somebody, I don't remember who it was, said, well, you know, the military nowadays is all about this word Agile, because they're trying to come up with Agile fighters and Agile fighting units. We should use the word Agile. And everybody Nah, the word agile is kind of stupid. You know, what, what should we call it? And we went around this for about 30 minutes, and you, nobody liked any of the words. And we finally had a vote, and the word agile won by a tiny little margin, and we decided to call it agile. Who knew? Who knew what was going to happen after that? We, um, we wrote the manifesto. The manifesto was crafted in about, oh, uh, an hour, I suppose. Uh, and somebody had this brilliant idea of stating it in four statements which were comparative. 
while we value the things on the left, we value the things on the right more. This was brilliant. This was genius. I don't know who did it. I can't remember. And no one seems to remember. The, uh, the manifesto fell together very quickly. The principles were uh, negotiated over several weeks by email. We all corresponded for a few weeks. Uh, after that few weeks, we kind of put it all on Ward's website. Who knows who Ward Cunningham is? Mm, now, more of you need to know who Ward Cunningham is. Uh, Ward Cunningham is the inventor of something we nowadays call the wiki. But that is not the greatest thing that Ward Cunningham was uh, responsible for. Most of the practices on that wall came out of Ward's brain one way or the other. I could talk about Ward Cunningham for hours and hours and hours, but I won't. Ward put it up on his website. We thought, well, fine. And he did this thing. He said, I've, I've allowed people to sign it. We, that was never part of the plan. You know, we didn't tell Ward, oh, go put this on your website and have people sign it. That was not it. He just kind of, you know, as Ward is, is wont to do, he just kind of thought, well, you know, I think I'll just see if people want to sign it. And they signed it by the tens of thousands. We did not know. We were not prepared. We did not understand the pent-up angst that this particular document had released. For a while, we thought, well, this is great. Yeah, we're really doing good. And we've got, we've got these agile methods out there. There's extreme programming. There's Scrum, which is really just extreme programming, except just the outer circle. There's a few others. Um, this is great. About a year after that, Ken Schwaber came to me and he said, Bob, I'd like to borrow one of your offices, one of your classrooms. At the time, I owned a, um, or I rented, a uh, fairly large facility that had classrooms in it. And I had a bunch of classrooms, and one of them was sitting idle. And he came to me and said, I'd like to, I'd like to borrow one of your classrooms uh, because I've got this idea. It's called um, um, Certified Scrum Master. Now, I didn't know what the heck that was. I knew what a scrum master was. I didn't know what this word certified meant. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Well, we're going to teach them how to be a scrum master, and then we're going to certify them. OK, you know, who, who wants that? But I said, go ahead, use a classroom of mine. Um, and he said, oh, thank you. And in, in return, all of your guys can attend and become certified scrum masters, which I thought, oh, yeah, OK, well, great. I couldn't be there. Uh, I left, so I am not a certified scrum master. I thought the idea was ridiculous, frankly. Um, who's going to want this dumb piece of paper for sitting in a class uh, for two days? You see the CSMs in the room? Yeah, so I was wrong. I was wrong big time. Um, it was a, a fad a movement. It was a wave that moved through the industry. And, and frankly, as I saw this wave move, I saw nothing but the positive aspects of it. I thought, this is great. People are signing up to learn how to do Agile well, and they're signing up in droves. They're paying money. They're going to classes. They're learning. It's wonderful. I believe that the whole CSM thing, for all of its faults, is responsible for moving Agile across whatever people call the chasm. It moved Agile to a completely different level. There was a rapid adoption of Agile because of this simple, quite ridiculous idea of a piece of paper. But Scrum has a problem. The propagation of Scrum so widely caused that problem to become glaring. Scrum is just that outer green circle. There are hints of the inner blue stuff, but for the most part, it's just that outer green circle. And for the most part, it's the three parts of that circle on the right. Acceptance tests are not usually thought of as being part of Scrum, or at least they weren't back then. What we had was the management part of Agile, not the developer part of Agile, not the team part of Agile, the development part of Agile. And Scrum addressed this because Scrum understood the lack. 
And Scrum addressed it by saying, well, the team will decide about all the rest of that. The team will decide if they will pair. The team will decide if they'll do continuous integration or something else. The team will decide because the team rules. This is a fatal flaw. It's a fatal flaw in Scrum. It's a fatal flaw in Agile at the moment because the team by itself has an agenda. And that agenda can be furthered, promoted by hiding things. The team does not want certain things exposed. And so if you allow the team to decide the team may decide against transparency. And if the team decides against transparency, the original goal of healing the divide between business and management begins to diminish. If the team is dedicated to transparency, fine. Then everything is OK. But humans are bizarre. Humans are able to rationalize things. Humans are able to say that they will create the most transparent team in history and then um, do otherwise. Humans have short-term agendas. And often those short-term agendas win over the long-term agendas. Every refusal or omission or modification of one of these practices without replacing it with something at least as effective is really an attempt to hide something. It's an expression of a hidden agenda in the team to make themselves look better than they are. This came to the ahead in roughly 2006, 2007, Martin Fowler wrote a, um, a very important paper. Some of you probably read it. It was called Flaccid Scrum. Who read this paper? Yeah, Flaccid, and the rest of you did not. Interesting. Flaccid Scrum, the idea here is simple. A Scrum team starts very effective. They can move fast. They work miracles. But over a period of sprints, they begin to slow down. They begin to act like a normal development team, uh, slowing down, trudging through mud. Their estimates grow. They start to lie about what being done is about. And they lose the benefit of Scrum. And why does this happen? One of the reasons it happens is because the code becomes a mess. Why does the code become a mess? Well, most of that inner red stuff is being ignored by the team. Lots and lots and lots of scrum teams began with the notion that all we needed to do was follow the rules of scrum and let the team decide. And we wound up with this flaccid imposter of what an agile process should be. As this was occurring, something else started to occur. I call this the rise of the project managers. The conferences that were in support of Agile used to be software conferences. We talked about software. We talked about technical stuff. We also talked about business stuff. We talked about management stuff. We talked about it all. If you look at that circle, there would have been talks on virtually every part of that circle. But then something happened, the rise of the project managers. Um, bit by bit, the emphasis of the, of the conferences, the emphasis of the working groups, the emphasis of Agile itself began to shift towards project managers. How many here is a project manager? Ooh, looks like about a third. How many of you are Scrum Masters who used to be project managers? Never mind. For some reason, Agile became a project manager's smorgasbord. 
There were interesting techniques and developments on the project management side. There was Lean, there was Kanban, there was all this interesting stuff. What was happening on the developer side? Go to an Agile conference. What's happening on the developer side? How many technical talks are there? What is the number one chief concern of software developers right now? And you could ma name a few. Uh, you know, is, is it what, what is the language of the server going to be? Is it going to be Node.js? You know, or is it going to be Java or C Sharp? Are those going to survive? Or, or what about all this functional stuff? And what's happened to Moore's Law? And how does that impact us? Those talks aren't here. Oh, you might see a bit of a scattering of them. You go to an Agile conference, maybe you'll see a little bit of that. But for the most part, those talks have gone to other conferences because Agile has become the domain of the project managers. Software developers are a bizarre bunch of people. I'm one. You can tell. Right? Um, software developers became software developers because they like working with people. <laughs> so when the rise of the, soft, the project managers occurred, these are the people who do like working with people. When that began to rise, the software developers did, did what geeks do. They went somewhere else. Well, I'm going to go hang out with people who like to talk about you know, Ruby you know, and then their problems with cucumber. I'm going to go hang out with those guys because these Project managers, they're, they're just talking about you know, lean, Kanban, work in progress. There was a reaction. The reaction was the craftsmanship movement. The craftsmanship movement began because software developers felt disenfranchised by the agile movement. They felt like the agile movement had left them, I'm not going to say behind, I'm just going to say left them, that they were off doing something else and they didn't care about the problems that the programmers had. And the programmers had a problem. And that problem was to define what software professionalism meant. How much software is running in this room right now? And forget the laptops, forget the smartphones. Don't turn any of them on. Look at the walls. How much software is embedded into the walls of this room? you got those projectors up there. There's a lot of software in them. Probably a million more or more lines of code. Um, there's these funny little things up there. I don't know what they are. I bet there's software in them, though. Are there, uh, is there software in the speakers? Nowadays, it is cheaper to put a digital signal processor in there uh, with a, uh, a, little DS, a little algorithm to filter out highs and lows than it is to put an inductor and a capacitor in Probably there's a little DSP in there. Maybe not. Maybe there is. Some do. What is that white thing up there? Is that a smoke alarm? Software in that thing? There's elevators out there. Software control those elevators? Go out and drive on the road. How much software is in a modern car? Modern car has 100 million lines of code in it. 100 million lines of code in a piece of metal that weighs several tons, moving at high speed towards you. This should terrify you. <laughs> With just cause. Who, who knows about the Toyota lawsuit, right? Cars that suddenly, because of a software fa failure, accelerate out of control and kill their inhabitants. We, as a society, are becoming impossibly dependent on software. We don't understand this yet. Our society does not realize how scary this situation is. We got a hint of it with healthcare.gov. There was a, a program that was passed into law, signed by the President of the United States. We had years to develop it, and they couldn't do it. What the hell happened there? I'm not talking about the policy issue. I'm talking about the software issue. The software developers, the managers, the teams, could not pull that off, and yet not one of them managed to say it to anybody who could stop the, pro the progress. As a result of that, there has been talk in the administration of a, a new cabinet position. The CTO of the United States, 
the secretary of software technology reporting to the president. That makes my blood run cold. Because one day, there will be an event. A terrible event. Some poor software schmuck, maybe he's in this room, <laughs> is going to write some dumb line of code. Anybody see the dumb lines of code written recently that exposed all of our credit card numbers? The two go-tos in a row at Apple? What idiots! Two go-tos in a row? How did that get past a code review? How did that get past static analysis? Two go-tos in a row? And all of our credit card numbers are exposed. One day this event will occur. Some poor software schmuck will do some dumb thing. He won't write the tests. He won't have paired. It won't be reviewed. Tens of thousands of people will die. And the politicians of the world will rise up in righteous indignation and they will point their finger at us. And now by this I mean all of us in the room, the entire software industry, and they will ask the question that must be answered, how could you have let this happen? And we'd better have an answer for them. Because if our answer is, well, we had to get to market fast, then the politicians of the world will do what they must and what they are good at. They will legislate. They will pass laws. Those laws will tell us what process we will use, what documents we will write, what job openings should be filled, what job positions there ought to be, what languages we will code in, what frameworks we will use. And we will become civil servants. That is an outcome to be resisted at all costs. So when this event occurs... And it must occur. I want our answer to be, here's our minimum set of standards. We don't go below this. These are our professional ethics on display. Here's our code of ethics that we get every software developer to swear to. Here's the minimum level of behavior we expect. And we make sure that all software developers who are software developers adhere to these rules. If we can do that, then we can say to the politicians of the world, what happened was an accident. It was not due to our negligence. This ought to be a topic at the Agile Conference because it's core to the Agile mindset. We need to be the people who get software done in the world in a society that is increasingly dependent on professional behavior. Out of this body should come the professional standards, the ethical statements, the technical rules. But what do we see instead? Instead we see two bodies. The software craftsmanship movement, which is busy working on this problem, by the way, and the agile movement, which is busy working on project management stuff. And notice that this represents business and development. And there is distrust. The original goal to heal the divide seems to have reversed itself. And now the divide is back in the Agile movement itself, in the very nature of the conferences that are in place. What's the solution? In my opinion, and I'll close my talk with this, in my opinion the solution to this is as follows. The software craftsmanship movement and the agile movement should find a way to reunify, to come together as a single entity. It is somehow wrong that agile and software craftsmanship are not the same movement. Somehow this has to be done. I don't know how. I put it to you. You're in the agile community. I've given the same talk to the software craftsmanship community. Somehow this has to come together. Somehow the leaders of the Agile movement and the leaders of the software craftsmanship movement should come together and find a way to forge 
an alliance that reasserts the idea that what we are about is healing the divide between business and management, not instantiating that divide. And if we can do that, then maybe we can make progress on this notion of what it means to be a professional software developer, a professional software manager, a professional software coach. Maybe we can come up with a set of ethics and a code of standards that will prevent the politicians of the world from legislating our futures. The future of Agile, legislation or self-determination? We get to pick that. And with that, I will close my talk. Thank you very much.